over the past few weeks, we have dealt quite extensively with the period of Ezra and then moving on to Esther. The time at the placement of this talk is BC 458. A mere 15 years after Purim was established by Mordecai to remember, to memorialize a time of joy, a time of great jubilation, a time when the Jews were delivered from the wicked hand of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagot, the enemy of the Jews. And so it is that some 15 years later, remember, Ezra would have been contemporary with that time because he's only 15 years and he is leaving Babylon to go through to Jerusalem. With one difference, of course, that King Xerxes, better known as Ahasuerus, was no longer in power. And his son, Artaxerxes, had then taken the throne in B.C. 464. And we pick up the narrative for which was read for us this evening. And I want to bring to your attention the impeccable pedigree of Ezra. <coughs> You'll see I've put it in two colors because the part I want you to focus on is the part in black. He is the son of Abishai, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eliasia, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra could trace his lineage all the way back to Aaron, the first high priest. And it says that this Ezra went up from Babylon. And that's a very interesting word, went up. More recently, I was told, and I cannot as yet say whether this was is 100% accurate or not, but in the Hebrew there are certain words which don't have an alternative in English. One of those words is immigrant. And what they did was they used a, a terminology because they knew that once a year that people would come up to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. And they were referred to as going up. And that is the word that's actually used in Hebrew for a immigrant. So it's interesting that this Ezra went up, besides the fact that Babylon is lower and Jerusalem is higher. But the point that I want to bring out of this is this, is that when we read this particular verse, this Ezra went up from Babylon and he was a ready scrub. And we almost seamlessly just breeze over that without taking any consideration as to what is being told. The word ready is the Hebrew merchahir, it means skillful, it means experienced, it means quick, prompt, ready. But it's also expeditious. He did everything meticulously and efficiently. He didn't wait for opportunities to arise, he created opportunities. He was a scrub a learned person who was able to read and write, probably with the focus on teaching the meaning of written documents. 
In other words, he was totally focused. 100% focused on God and on God's word. And it says that this Ezra was a ready scrub in the law of Moses, which Yahweh Elohim of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of Yahweh his God upon him. You know what's interesting with that last phrase there? Is the king had explicit trust in him. It would appear that all ordinances, anyone that has a good understanding of God's word, appreciates the fact that all powers, the most high God rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it whom, to whomsoever he wishes. And therefore, the one that is in power, well, we are to respect. And I think that that particular attitude and that reception was taken up by this king and it most certainly was taken up by Cyrus and most certainly taken up by Dores Hestaspus in relation to Daniel. And they knew that their particular motive and their understanding, their entire demeanor was all focused around their God so they didn't pose any threat. They didn't pose any threat to him. These were men that were trusted. And that is why it says that the Lord God had, uh, had given and the king granted him all of his request. Now, why is this so important? Why is this so important? Why, am I, why did I labor on that a little bit longer than I should? Well, I'd like to introduce you to the word Neshiba. That only occurs once in the entire Bible. And it means an environment. It means a circumstance or turn of affairs. In other words, it's a word to illustrate that God has been in control of a particular environment to bring about a result that was conducent to his word. The only time it occurs is in 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 12 to 15, and it's dealing with Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And just to pick it up from the beginning, so Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam, and on the third day, as the king bade, saying, Come again to me on the third day. And the king answered them roughly, and King Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men and answered them, after the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastened you with whips, but I will chasten you with scorpions. So the king hearkened not unto the people for the cause, the environment. There's your word was of God that Yahweh might perform his word which he had spake by the hand of Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that famous name, miners obviously, who made Israel to sin. So you can see, God works within the nations. And I've brought out that word environment because I believe it is extremely important when you consider the environment that Ezra was leaving. Remember, we had discussed over the last few talks that the place that he was in was filled predominantly by them which were termed about them, those who were not prepared to take the risk of going back to Jerusalem to fulfill the prophecy, the 70 year prophecy. <coughs> and it was only with the intervention of God using both Mordecai and Esther and King Ahasuerus as objects to bring about his ultimate purpose that Haman was destroyed, 
the decree was brought to an abrupt halt. And in actual fact, as it says in the, the ESV, on the very day that the decree from Haman was to go forth and destroy and to kill and to annihilate the Jews, the very opposite happened. And so the Purim was established on BC 473 to commemorate the joy and the liberation of how happy the Jews were. And that's where he had just come from. You see, you would have noticed a picture in the background. That's Haman hanging from the gallows. But because it was 50 cubits high. The point that was being brought out in relation to the environment was the environment that they were in had to be changed. God could not reproduce a fruit, a seed, meat for him to come out of there and to perform the work that he had in store for them back in the land of Jerusalem. We were going to sing hymn 142, but somebody changed it. But what the words that are in there is God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders do perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Beautiful words. It's telling us he's in total control. And sometimes when we read God's word, sometimes when we sing words from the hymn, we are inclined to just blah, 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 blah. We sing them, actually sometimes not really looking at the words and believing that this is a great God that is able to bring about these things. And that is why I believe that Ezra continuously uses the words, the hand of Yahweh, his God, upon him. And so we'll pick up the narrative from verse 7 and we'll go through. Can you see that? And there went up some of the children of Israel and of the priests and of the Levites and the singers and the porters and the Nethanims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. Now that's pretty much a summary. But what it's telling you is that he was granted in BC 458 the ability to go to Jerusalem. And it's telling you that he arrived in Jerusalem in BC 457 because it was a four month journey. And it goes on to say, For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Can you see the reason why? It is so important to understand just how important these words are that he was already scrub. Everything about this man, everything about this man was totally centered and focused around God. He relied explicitly on God. He trusted explicitly on God. And Ezra had prepared his heart, for Ezra had prepared his heart, to seek the law of Yahweh and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. You know, it's interesting. There's another word we read over, for. It actually means because. That's what it means in the Hebrew. And you can only really appreciate it when you read the previous verse. In a fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him because Ezra had prepared his heart, his mind to seek. That word prepared. It's an amazing word. It means to prepare, to make ready, to erect, to set up, to determine 
to fix a point, to make firm, to feel inclined, to be intent on, to be firmly resolved. That was his attitude. You couldn't get a better description of someone's determination to do his job. And he was going to seek. Now, for those who can't see that at the back, the word seek means to inquire, to seek, to diligently seek, to seek out, to search, and more important, it's required. You see, this wasn't for Ezra just about being a man of God's word and being able to search out his work. He felt that as a integral part of his entire life he needed it like a body needs water that is how he viewed his work as i said ezra did not did not wait for an opportunity you got to think about this when it says that the king granted him all his requests just consider some of the requests that he had made he wanted the remaining captives to be free to return to Jerusalem. He wanted permission to apply and teach God's law in Jerusalem and Judah. He wanted to take gold and silver from the king's treasury, I might add, to beautify the house of God and to buy everything needful for the sacrifices. That must have taken a lot of courage to go to a king, a man of that power, and seek and put forward those requests. But look what Artaxerxes says. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of God. That's how he viewed him. He viewed him as a scribe of the law of God. This man is different. The law of God of heaven, perfect peace, and at such time, I make a decree. And we all know what the decree meant. Once it's made, you don't reverse it. That all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, and that in the Hebrew means the entire realm, which I minded. Very interested word. It comes from the Hebrew word pronio. It means determined. It's a volunteer as well. But it's telling you that this is a person that was so determined to volunteer freely, willingly. And he says that of the priests and of the Levites in my realm, which are determined to volunteer of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. What's important about that is that was the second chance that those about them were been given. The second chance. The first chance when Zerubbabel, when Shezbezer, when Jeshua, and when all the others left. In when? B.C. 538. There were those about them that decided not to stay. Oh yes, they gave money, but decided not to go. They stayed. And just like those that were in Esther's time, that were given the opportunity to go and did it, God brought about judgment and here it is that now that that environment had been changed in there it's amazing that there is a remnant that is prepared prepared to leave some 1500 of them look what it goes on to say for as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of thy God, 
which is in thine hand, and to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Jerusalem, God of Israel, I beg your pardon, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. <coughs> and I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, to make a decree to all the treasurers which are beyond the river. Do you remember that term? That whosoever Ezra the priest, and whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it shall be done speedily. No delays. Isn't that interesting? Because the ready scrub means to do it speedily. And yeah, the king is saying, I want you to do it speedily. But more than that, he installs un into his hand a hundred talents of silver and to a hundred measures of wheat and to a hundred baths of oil and to a hundred baths of wine and salt without prescribing how much. And then he goes on to say, And whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and of his sons? Can you see how God's work is going in a complete circle? Man has this ability to move away from God and God chastises and brings them back and nurtures them. Those were almost the identical words that Doris Hestaspus told who? Tataniah and Shishar both and I. When they sent the letter and he said, if a man doesn't do this, let a beam be taken out of his house and let him be impaled upon there and let his house become a dunghill. Therefore, do it with all diligence. I, Darius, have spoken. And here we have Artaxerxes, the grandson of Darius Hestaspus. Also, we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, dethanims, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand. Can you see the trust this king's got with this man? There's total trust because he knows this man is a man of scruples. This man is a man that has very high standards. This is a man that will not go back on what his God tells him to do. And King Long desert his trust set. Because look what else what he says. That is in thine hand set magistrates and judges which shall judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God and teach them that know them not. You know, that's a very interesting word because it is the Hebrew word yadah. And what it means is to understand, know, learn, or teach. So this wasn't about just teaching somebody. In fact, the word teach in the same sentence is the same word, yada. And what it's saying to you is this. Don't just teach them parrot fashion. Teach them so they understand the word of God. In other words, God's word has to be in you like a burning flame. It's not a mental thing. It's a mental thing. It starts there, but it goes through your entire body and becomes a way of life. That is what it's telling you. And whosoever will not do it. Another interesting word because it's a cognate word. It's a composite word. It's actually... In the transliteration, is only one word. But in the Hebrew, it's two words. It's the word hava, 
and this word avad. Now those two words make up the word do because he's saying to you that it's not just a case of, well, I won't do it. He's building on what he told you before when he said you have to teach him no. Because it's telling you that this word do is composite of having to exist as the right kind of person, but also to observe with quality. So if you're not prepared to do your job with the utmost conviction, and not just a mental thing, or be one of those that are about them, it's telling you here, let judgment be executed speedily by a man that was a ready scrub who implemented things speedily. Can you see what's been told you? Upon him, whether it be unto death or banishment or confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. This was serious stuff. This was a man, Ezra, that had been given the opportunity to, if needs be, have a man put to death based on God's law. You see, this is a firm reminder to us that God provides opportunities for men and women, but these opportunities can pass and we let them go at our peril. An environment has to be changed. God will change it. The environment that we're in. Then it's up to us to change our attitude, to be ready scrubbed, so that we don't change it back to what it was, which is exactly what the Jews were doing. Exactly what they were doing. So the lessons we've learned so far is this. It's about preparation. It's about practical implementation of God's word. God will create an environment for a remnant. An environment for his word to grow. We all have choices, just like Adam and Eve did. Our focus needs to be centered on God. God centered exactly how Ezra was. God will create opportunities for his people, but we have to make the choice just like those that will be given the second choice, the second chance to separate themselves from the environment that they were in that God had prepared for them. And we have to turn to God and he will turn to us. We have to separate from our old way of life and that is actually a pre requisite because if they didn't Ezra had the ability to implement any one of those punishments at his discretion in fact when you put it in a nutshell the law of God once learned and adopted as a rule of life must be taught to others and that is the difference with, with the word teach and know Just look at the caliber of this man. Blessed be Yahweh God of our fathers, who hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of Yahweh which is in Jerusalem, and hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors, and before all kings, the king's mighty princes, and... I was strengthened as the hand of Yahweh my God was upon me. And I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go with me. You know, as human beings, we have this incredible ability to have the three setbacks. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We do something. 
And if we're not careful to refrain ourselves, invariably, instead of giving glory to God when things happen to go right, we give glory to ourselves because we say, we're the ones that masterminded it. We implemented it. Look how good I am. That's not the trademark of, ex of Ezra. He says that I'm so blessed that God has put this in the king's heart. And not only that, that he strengthened me with his hand. That I can gather together people. People that have made the choice to volunteer of their own free will. They're going to be the same as me. And to come up with me. And I gathered them to the river that runneth to a hover. And there we abode in tents three days. And I viewed the people and the priests. But there's a setback. I found there none. None of the sons of Levi. They weren't there. They decided not to come. Three days is quite significant in Scripture. Three days with Jonah in the belly of the whale. Three days the Son of Man in the heart of the earth. Three days in Exodus chapter 3 verse 18 that Moses and Aaron go to the, the Pharaoh and say, we need to go out three days into the desert because Yahweh our God has visited us. And we are to go out there and worship him. So why do you think Ezra took them to a place by a river near Hava? Well, it doesn't tell you explicitly. But if you read the narrative, this is built on the fact that they were in a very very sick society. Yes, God had turned the hearts of those about them by the mere fact that he had delivered them from total annihilation. But 15 years had passed. 15 years. A lot happens in 15 years. And so what he was doing was he was taking them out once again the principle of separation. But not too far. Because if someone didn't want to stay, they had the opportunity to go back because this had to be a volunteer's choice. And when they get there, you've got to remember that this was a ready scrub. He was full with the knowledge of God's law. And he would have expounded to them. He would have taken them out of, as it were, the city lights, into the desert. No smog, no smoke, just the glory and beauty of God's creation. And he would have exposed to them all the glories of God's word. And he would have told them how God's planning purpose was with the earth. And he would have showed to them how that God created all these things about them. He would have uplifted them. But also, it's a strong possibility that this would be the first time that he'd ever met those people that were there. So there would have been an opportunity to have fellowship, to get to know, to learn their concerns, to find out where they thought their dangers were going to be for them and their family. To encourage them to say to them that God is with them. That they will never have a problem. And also to set in place certain people. That would take on the obvious task of going out into the wilderness. I put this together because it's only when you look at it that you can appreciate the kind of beauty that he would have taken them to. And they would have sat there and abode in tents 
three days and he viewed the people. This wasn't a time way back. This was in BC 458. Ezra's come out. They didn't have luxurious places to sleep in. They slept in tents. And the desert can get cold at night. And we see in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 22 that Moses stretched forth his hand towards heaven and there was a thick darkness in the, all the land of Israel three days. And they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. You see, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And that was the principle that he was getting taught. He's telling them, the hand of Yahweh, my God, is upon me. He's upon you. Fear not. He will guide us. These are the words of encouragement that he would have been instilling them for three days. I'm with you. What did God say to Haggai? Tell them I'm with you. I am with them with the outstretched arm. I am with them to deliver them. Yahweh shall be seen above them. And his arrow shall go forth as the lightning. You cannot miss the power of God. It's there all around. He's saying to them, I'm going to deliver you with a mighty hand. God is here. Look around you. Look at the beauty of this place. It's all the hand of the Creator. Look at what the psalmist said. Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my strength in whom I trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. You don't have anything to worry about. And he would have exposed to them the beauty of the Messiah. The Prince of Peace. That they were going back as a remnant that God had brought about in His Word in, the, in, in Numbers 14, 21. As truly as I live, saith Yahweh, as truly as I live. You can put that in concrete. All the world will be covered with the glory of the Lord. So there's a few questions we need to ask. Why were the people taken out of Babylon? How far were they from Babylon? What was spoken about? Were they going to return to Babylon briefly? More importantly, where were the sons of Levi? Because they weren't there. I'll tell you where they were. They're back with about them. It was too difficult. Far too difficult to go to Jerusalem. So the question we have to ask then is, and which may have been asked here, um, Ezra, do we go back and fetch them? The answer? No. They don't deserve it. They've made their choice. Look what he says. Then I, then said I for Eliezer and for Ariel, for Shemaiah and for El Nathan and for Jerob and for El Nathan and for Nathan and for Zechariah and for Meshulam, chief men. And then also for Jerob and for El Nathan, men of understanding. You've got two different groups. You've got chief men, men of renown, valia, astute, and you've got the wisdom of men of understanding. And look what Ezra does. He sends them to the commander under Ido, the chief at the place of Cassiphia. He tells them, what to say and he tells them what to do that they will bring unto them ministers for the house of our God 
Now, when you take a look, just in retrospect, that is the distance between the two. It doesn't look like much on a map, but when you consider that the distance of that orange line is 900 miles, 1,444 kilometers, you're still talking about a reasonable time. So the question's to be asked again. Why were the people taken out of Babylon? To prepare them for the journey, to uplift them, to encourage them. How far were they from Babylon? Nine days. How do we know that? Chapter 8 verse 31 tells us that they left on the 12th day of the first month. We read in chapter 7 that they left on the first day of the first month. They stayed at the river for three days. So therefore, 12 minus 3 is 9. It took them nine days to get there. Three days there, and then they left. What was spoken about? Exhortation. Encouragement. Teaching. Were they going to return to Babylon briefly? Only those whose hearts were not prepared. Not prepared. Look what it says in verse 18. This is quite amazing. This is the, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He put it to prayer. And by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Mila, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebiah, with his sons and his brethren eighteen, and Hashabai, and with him Jeshiah, of the sons of Merari, his brethren and their sons twenty, also of the Nethanims, whom David and the princes had appointed for the service of the Levites, two hundred and twenty Nethanims. All of them were expressed by name. So let's get this. We've got 38 sons of Levi, and we've got 220 Nethanims to do the onerous tasks that the Levites didn't have to do. That is why he wasn't prepared to go back to Babylon. Why? He knew. He knew that God would not forsake. You know, when you look at that, it tells us our deduction from that. Work done for God and not for selfish motives brings its own reward. Peace of mind and contentment. Ezra wasn't phased in the least. He recognized the problem. He put it in God's hands. God had given him the wisdom. He implemented a plan B. And God delivered. You see, it was now time to leave. But the first thing. Then I proclaim, proclaimed a fast there at the river of Hava. I had to put that up. What? No food? Think about that. we got a 900 mile journey ahead of us. What does he do? What is the first thing? we in 2017 would do when you speak to any military man he says our army marches on his stomach let's get something in us we need the strength we've got a long audience journey ahead of us no he proclaimed a fast day at the river Ahava that we might afflict ourselves it's the word humble we're going to humble ourselves before God. Why? So that to seek of Him a right way. You know, those are beautiful words. Because that should be the benchmark in our lives. Is to seek a right way from Yahweh. And not just for us, for our little ones. And for all our substance. We want total dedication to God. And then he goes on to say, For I was ashamed 
to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all of them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. In other words, what they're saying is this. Well, we trusted in God. And besides that, there's no way we would go back to the king and ask him for guidance because we had already told him that we trust in God. That is what we do. So we put it to, to prayer. We put it to fasting. And what does chapter 8 verse 22 to 23 say? Reading from the English Standard Version, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him. And the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So he fasted and implored our God for this. And he listened. He listened. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 says, Whatever thy hand findest to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in a grave whither thou goest. You do it first. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. That's the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, there's a problem. There's an ecclesial problem. Or there's this problem. We'll work through it and we'll get to it at some stage in the future. And while you're doing that, something happens. It's too late. Your time is up. Then I separated twelve of the chief of the priests of Sherebiah, Hazabiah, and ten of their brethren with them, and they weighed of them the silver and the gold and the vessels, even the offerings of the house of our God, which the king and his chancellors and his lords and all Israel there had offered. You see? All the ones that were there had offered. He's talking, still talking about them. Those that haven't left. You see... They didn't shirk their responsibility. Then departed from the river on the twelfth day of the first month to go unto Jerusalem. And the hand of our God. Can you see this word coming up all the time? Can you see the total dedication, the total trust in God? Was upon us. And he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from such as lay in wait by the way. And we came to Jerusalem. And what? About their three days. They start off three days, they end off with three days. You know, that word first. On the Babylonian calendar, it's the month of Nisan. But in the Jewish calendar, it's the month of Abib. Now, when was the month of Abib? In Exodus chapter 12. This shall be the first of months for you. It shall be the month of the new moon, the month of a bib. On the tenth day of the month, thou shalt take a lamb, one year without blemish, and thou shalt keep it. And for four days thou shalt scrutinize it and make sure that there is no blemish. And on the fourteenth day of a bib, thou shalt sacrifice it as a memorial forever, because it is the Passover lamb. Two days before the Passover, they were leaving. Two days. Is that a familiar date? Well, actually it is. Because it was exactly the same day that Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, wrote the decree. You know, the word nine means finality or judgment. You couldn't put it in a better frame as to what happened to Haman. What Acts chapter 17 verse 31 says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Now let's just get an idea of how difficult this journey was. Stock levels. There were 1,500 Jews. There was food. Food to feed 1,500 people. 
temple offerings. By temple offerings, I mean the animals, right? They were their possessions, clothes. You know, men would probably put theirs in the haversack, and the woman probably need about two or three camels. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, and then you've got 25 tons of silver. You've got three tons of gold. Put a value on that. Just put a value on that. And all the other bits and pieces that go with it. So now what you've got is a 900 mile, 1448 kilometer journey. Now even in today's terms, on highways, try and drive in that, drive in that distance. Mostly at, oh, I feel like a coffee. Right, in with a coffee, out with a burger, you know, out with a pie, go another 40 kilometers, next pit stop, and so forth. But we have to admit, it could have been pretty easy for them because what they could have done was the men could have just jumped in their four-wheel drive, shot across, and if they found anything that was on the way, they could have put one of their gunships to do a reconnaissance flight over the route just to make sure there were no robbers there. And then they could have got them out of the way. And once they were out of the way, then it's just a case of the furniture removal truck bringing all the rest of the goods over and it's done and dusted. Well, actually, it doesn't work like that because what they had to do was travel that by camel. Almost 1,500 kilometers carrying almost, when you amortize the weights, around about 40 tons conservatively. But it would have given that four months, it would have given Ezra the opportunity, at every st opportunity that he had to uplift the people, to encourage them, to tell them the responsibility that they had while they were doing what they were doing. Look what happens when they come to Jerusalem. And when they came to Jerusalem, they abode there three days. What's the first thing they do? They rest. Then, they don't shirk their responsibility. They safely deliver the temple's treasures. <coughs> so they completed their responsibility. And then what they do? Well, everybody else could have said, Yay, we're in Jerusalem. Time to go shopping. Not for Ezra. He offers a sin offering. He wasn't going to get caught in the same trap as everybody else that pray to God for deliverance, get deliverance, and then forget God when deliverance comes. You see, it's a, it's a, it's a case of give and take. Not God gives and we take. That's the point he's trying to bring out. He thanks God for his deliverance question is, do we thank God when we pray for something and we get deliverance? Do we? It's not an easy thing to do. It doesn't come natural to human nature. So let's just go back to BC 457 because that would have, would have been now the time period that they're in Jerusalem now. A whole year hasn't transpired, but it would have overlapped into the new year. So it's BC 457. <coughs> And what happens is this. When these things were done, giving back all the bits and pieces, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the princes and the Levites have not separated themselves. You see that word that comes up all the time in theme and openly exposed have not separated themselves from the people of the land, doing according to the abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. All the people that Joshua should have destroyed out of the land, very similar actually, very similar to the Amalekites. What happened to the Amalekites? Well, Haman the Agagite was from the seed of the Amalekites, and he came back to haunt them. 
And here we got the same situation to those who not are about them, but are afar off. What we're talking about is serious apostasy. In 59 years, from the time the temple was built to then, it had degraded to such a state that intermarriage was running rough. Look what they say to him. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and the rulers have been chief in this trespass. You know, Deuteronomy, they, Israel was a man of a ready scrub, perfect in God's law. <coughs> Do you think he would not have been aware of this quote? For thou art a holy people unto Yahweh thy God. And Yahweh thy God has chosen thee to be a special people. And they were not to mingle with those people around them. But they did. What did Israel say to them before they left Ahava? And I said unto them, Ye are holy unto Yahweh. And the first thing they're confronted with is when they get there, they are told that there's an apostasy going on here. We are talking about a serious slippage from high standards. No matter what Ezra could have prepared himself for, he was totally unprepared for this. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and I plucked off my hair off my head and off my beard, and I sat astoned. You know what that word means? It means to tremble. It means he was shaken. He was emotionally devastated. So much so that he treats this as a death. Because those are all the factors that one did when somebody died. Someone has died. That is how seriously he took it. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat trembling until the evening sacrifice. You know what's astounding about this? Throughout this entire record that we've looked at in all seven talks so far, We've had God looking upon the nation of Israel and saying to them, turn from your ways and turn to me. Otherwise, I will bring a force against you. Remember my Sabbaths. Do not pollute the land and my house. And what they did was, they still sinned. And then what happened? They went into exile. And then they cry to God for deliverance. And then God brings them back through his mercy. After he's chastised them and brings out a remnant. You know what the next move is? Sin again. Just can't help themselves. It's like deja vu. You know, you could have to, you have to ask the question. Can it get worse than what he thought? Do you know why he was so upset? It's because he knew the significance of the morning and the evening sacrifice. It was a time. It was a time when the people of Israel had the opportunity in humble repentance to come before God so that God could sanctify His people. And what they were doing is making it into an abomination. But there's a big problem lurking in the background that we aren't told in Ezra. And the only way to see this is to go to contemporary information. 
So let's look at some contemporary information. Well, first, I haven't bothered to put in Doris Hestespus and, and, and uh, Cyrus, king of Persia. We've focused on BC 486, which is Xerxes or Ahasuerus, Esther and Mordecai, Purim established BC 473, Artaxerxes becomes king, and Ezra takes into exile. What is interesting is this, is Malachi's ministry was contemporary BC 500 to 460, 40-year period. In other words, Ezra would have known Malachi. He may not have been contemporary at the time that he left, but bear in mind, Ezra didn't leave at one year old. So at BC 458, he would have probably left at the age of 40 to 50 years old. That's the current reasoning. So there's only a two-year difference between the end of his ministry and the leaving of Ezra. So he would have been well in the center of this. So what we have to do is we've now got to go back from the time of Mordecai and we've got to go back into the time of Malachi and see what Malachi was making reference to of those people that were afar off. The one that Ezra is now actually going to, the one that he's just been told are intermarrying. And we want to see what Malachi has to say about it. You see, it just got worse. Because <coughs> Malachi chapter 2 and verse 11 says, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of Yahweh which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. Yahweh will cut off the man that does this, the master and the scholar out of the tabernacle of Jacob and him that offereth an offering unto Yahweh of armies. And this ye have done again, covering the altar of Yahweh with tears, with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore and receiveth it and or receiveth it with goodwill at your hand. Why? What do they say? Wherefore? What do you mean we've done this? Because Yahweh has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, which thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant? And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit and wherefore one? that he might seek a godly seed, because he's setting the example of the bride of Christ. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For Yahweh God of Israel saith, I hate putting away. What was happening, in reality, is while Esther and Mordecai were dealing with Haman at Shushan, on the other side, everybody was having a glorious time, doing whatever they wanted. At the top of it, divorcing. Let's take a look at some of the questions and accusations God throws at them in Malachi, which was written exactly for that time frame when this was happening in Jerusalem because Malachi was contemporary with that. And I think a lot of times when we look at Ezra and we look at the system that was happening at that particular time, we totally overlook this. God says, where is my fear? Saith Yahweh of armies unto you. O priests that despise my name. Wherein have we despised your name? You offer polluted bread upon my altar. Wherein do we do that? You done again covering the altar of Yahweh with tears. Wherein? You have wearied Yahweh with your words. Wherein have we done that? 
Return to me and I will return to you, saith Yahweh of armies. Wherein should we do that? I will not. You have robbed me. Wherein have we robbed me? Robbed you. Your words have been stout against me, saith Yahweh. Wherein have we done that to? I mean, why are we getting blamed for all these things? Which one sits the worst out of all those? Any guesses? The one God hates. The one he hates. It's the only time he uses it. For Yahweh, the God of Israel, saith, I hate putting away. You see, the thing is, is when we look at this, were they actually thankful for the work that was going on and the deliverance that was being initiated in Shishan? No, they weren't. Because they weren't directly affected with it. Some may have, some wouldn't have. The reality of it is this, is they had a, hu a husband and a wife situation. The husband would be divorcing his wife and he'd be going over and marrying woman of a foreign god because the Jews at all times had this desire and interest in those women. So, what did it mean for the children of Israel? It meant a dead end. Pretty much a dead end. What they were doing by that was they were alienating themselves from God. And it was Ezra that realized that unless the sacrifices were being done consistently and in order, it was an absolute sign of God sanctifying his children. And unless those sacrifices were being conducted in the appointed way, there was no guarantee to have the uh, assurance of God's presence among the people. And it was the exact reason that God had taken the people from the land so that his land could heal, took them over to Babylon or the Assyrians, chastised them, and then relies on them making an individual executive choice as to who would actually come from there and come back to rebuild. And here the process is starting all over again. So sometimes when we read Ezra, we are inclined to think that marrying the foreign wives was the problem. It was the result. The problem was caused when they put away their wives, as Malachi said. And that is the cause of the problem. But it goes deeper than that. Because the priests were doing that. Look what, just quickly, look what Ezra does. At the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and I spread out my hands. I prostrated myself before God. It said, Oh my God, I, Israel, am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass is grown up into the heavens. Want to see an interesting word? Our. He was not involved with that transgression. He may have transgressed, but he was not involved. But he associated himself with it. Why? In all the letters to the seven ecclesias, tell me when the Lord Jesus Christ picks out one individual out the ecclesia. He passes judgment as an ecclesia. I have seen thy works. However, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast suffered Balaam, the son of Beer. I have seen thy works, and you have done this, and you have done it. However, thou have suffered that woman Jezebel. I have seen thy works, and so forth. However, thou have lost thy first love. This was about 
taken a responsibility for something that happened in his house. In God's house. And what does scripture say? Of whose house we are. Proverbs 28 says, A man shall be commended according to his wisdom, but he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. That is the word iniquity. It comes from the Hebrew word, which is a cognate word, which is Wechachan. And it actually transliterates into Nephel. Because it's a cognate word, it has three different variations of the word. And it means perverse. Ezra was absolutely out of his mind. He felt vulgar in the presence of God. Not only that, he associated himself directly with it because he knew, he knew that ultimately it was his responsibility to do that. All for one and one for all. Just take a look at the next verse. Take a look how many times that word comes. If it had been any one of us, we would have said, well, I haven't done this, and I haven't done this, and that's that person, and we'll have to get around to that, and that person did that, and it wasn't me, I'm still okay, it doesn't affect me really. Since the days of our fathers, to this day, we have been very guilty for our iniquities. We, our kings, our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to the captivity, to plunder, to utter shame. You know what that word shame is? It's actually the word which means confusion of faith. It's the same word that means utter destruction. It's the same word that Daniel uses in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 8 where he says, we have sinned. That is what it means. Confusion of faith. He's saying, we're imploring you, God, forgive us for our iniquities, but he was never involved with it in the first place. Can you see what I'm saying? And he's telling that because he knew that the only way that they could actually alleviate or prevent total self-destruction of the children of Israel that were there at that time was to humbly come and seek repentance from God. Because look what he says. We went into all that devastation and destruction and everything as it is this day. That's what he's praying for. Is to have that part overturned. And when it says there. That God. Our God. He's given us a little grace. To leave us a remnant to escape. Malachi chapter 3 says this. Then they that feared Yahweh spake often one to another. And Yahweh hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him. For them that feared Yahweh and thought upon his name. Interesting. Who were the people that came to Israel when he got there? When he publicly showed his disgust and how revolting it was. Then were gathered to him all those who feared Yahweh and they spoke to one another. This is concurrent. It's contemporary. When it talks about a pig, the most standout place for the pig is in Isaiah 22 at verse 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. Who's that talking about? Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. Ezra knew all the quotations that Moses had spoke regarding the Messiah. He knew that without the remnant in that house, 
that would not be fulfilled. And hence he humbly pleaded to God as a co-member of that house of God. He put himself humbly in a position that I'm one of them and I'm as guilty as them. It's an amazing thing, brothers and sisters. Absolutely incredible thing to behold God's word. So where is this going to lead to? Unfortunately, you'll have to wait till next week for that.